Before the month of January 1935 had ended, Al Woods changed the title of the play again, though the change was reversed soon enough. Woods announced several interesting casting choices, actors whose Hollywood successes were considerable achievements. This news story makes it appear Louis Calhoun was and was not set for the male lead. Louis Calhoun could play Brainy Gangster, Tough Businessman, or a combination thereof, as here in 1934. Now, I'm just going to have a little slip there. Will you join me? Don't mind if I do. How's business? Oh, not so hot, no? I got in a thousand cases of champagne. A1 stuff, too. Can't move it. Competition? No. <laughs> no. Depression. Mm. I had to close three of my own speakeasies last month. Can you imagine that? Mm. How are you with the district attorney? Oh, all right. His men raid my joints once in a while, and I open up again, but that's his job, so why squawk? Those fast fingers belong to Barbara Stanwyck, coordinating body and brain, a quick mind which you'll next see propose a news series to her editor in a 1941 scene. Now, then comes the drama. He meets discouragement. He finds the world his feet of clay. His ideals crumble. So what does he do? He decides to commit suicide and protest against the state of civilization. He thinks of the river, but no. No, he has a better idea. The city hall. Why? Because he wants to attract attention. He wants to get a few things off his chest, and that's the only way he can get himself heard. So? So? So he writes me a letter, and I dig him up. He pours out his soul to me. And from now on, we quote, I protest by John Doe. I can give you lots of reasons. Kay Francis often embodied a world-weary demeanor. Uh, yes, uh, sorry, you give me the cue. Uh, 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 Jim. Nonetheless, her roles were often intelligent, accomplished, romantic. The main thing is I got her to... She was not a funny person, but could give in to laughter. Mrs. Mason will get behind him, me, or something. Uh, oh, honey. It's a lovely day, isn't it? Uh, yep. I, I think I need a little help there. Yes. Looks like you've been on a shopping spree. Yeah, I have. Got the weapons in there? There you are. There's your money. Whoops. Ah. Uh, whoa, whoa. Where's the car, Tony? Here's a change. <laughs> Anne Harding was more soft-spoken than the others. Harding and her roles came across as intelligent and sensitive, yet ethereal. Suddenly, I feel shy with you. Oh, I don't like it. Oh, you're going to tell me something terrible. What is it? Considering how often Ayn Rand's writings concern integrity, it's worth a minute to see how Anne Harding plays a scene discussing it. Look at those great publishers, Williamson Warren. They sell millions of copies in drugstores. What difference does it make? Where they sell them? None. Except, if you want to keep your integrity, you, well, you, you can't go in for mass production, can you? I, I mean, you can't just become a, a little cog in the big machinery. Can you? Well, uh, don't let's argue about that. Oh, why not? Daisy, listen. I, I want never to... Never mind, never mind. I, I just shouldn't have said anything at all until I've read it through. That book will make money. Money? Is that so awfully important? I haven't got any, but you know, I feel, I feel quite all right. Well, you're not a married man. No. No, I, I suppose that does make a difference. Elwood's stay in Hollywood had decided him on Ralph Morgan, a versatile actor who sometimes played creeps, loners, unemotional connivers, and oddballs. His characters could say something sincere and be taken to be unscrupulous. We're seeing him in 1936, the year following Elwood's having decided on Morgan for a role in the debut of The Night of January 16 that Morgan never played. Stop calling me Anderson. I finished with that idiot when I walked out of San Quentin. Foster's the real name. Don't want me to be calling you Jenkins, do you? You know what my plans are. 50-50 split. Only we've got to go slow. After waiting 18 years, I'm taking no chances. 18 years in the jute mill. 18 years burning my eyes out, reading, trying to make myself the kind of a father my daughter could be proud of. Well, I'm making no move now that will cheat me out of... On opening night, the top cast members named in the advertising were Edmund Brees and Walter Pidgeon. Ayn Rand wrote in the introduction to her published version of the play that Walter Pidgeon's getting the male lead role, Guts Regan, 
was my one contribution to the casting. At the time, Pigeon was regarded as through in Hollywood. He had been one of my favorites in the silent movies, and I would seen him on the stage in Hollywood, so I suggested that Woods go to see him in summer stock. Woods was so impressed with Pigeon's performance that he signed him for night of January 16th at once. Shortly after our opening, Pigeon signed a long-term movie contract with MGM, which was his new start in pictures, the beginning of his rise to stardom. He told me later that he owed that contract to his performance as Guts Regan. Days before the Broadway opening, the play had a Philadelphia tryout, and the reviewer for Variety who saw Pigeon play Guts Regan there wouldn't have been surprised by the MGM contract. He practically predicted it. Pigeon was still an MGM player 19 years later, which is where we catch up with him attempting something shady. Opportunity, my dear, is concerned with the future, not the past. Oh, look. If it's collateral you're worrying about, I happen to own oil leases in Texas that are worth, uh, well, you know, Texas. Oh, Daddy. It's a very straightforward answer. Try to overcome this tendency. You understand, of course, that I can't afford to give you a large wedding. Do you know what you're getting for a wedding present? Well, Helen, tell me what not to expect. My dear sir, you are getting the old family joke. 4,000 acres of invaluable oil land. Thank you very much, sir. Not at all. You know, after all, it's not bad being an oil baron, even if there's no oil. <laughs> During the Broadway run of the night of January 16, Edmund Brees played District Attorney Flint. Here he plays a judge. You are charged with being an habitual drunkard. How do you plead, guilty or not guilty? I lack words to express my disappointment with you. You have fallen from a pinnacle of fame and fortune why only a short time ago you were universally lauded and in my opinion rightfully so as one of the greatest living actors of the stage and screen. Yours was an achievement, an art that gladdened the world and made it a more beautiful place to live in. Your enforced abstinence may enable you to find yourself so with that hope, I am about to sentence you. In another film, Brees played defense attorney. The unknown woman, the daughter of this defendant. What's your honor? We mean your honor to prove that Millicent Blake went to the lodge that night and shot Jimmy Damier. Not from jealousy, but to rescue her innocent 16-year-old daughter from this blackguard who had lured her there under such circumstances that the shooting was justified. Edmund Brees came to his top-billed role in Night of January 16 having already performed in a drama based on the death of Ivar Kruger because he had appeared in Warner Brothers film The Match King in 1932. Sarah Patton was in the Broadway run of The Night of January 16 as Magda Zvinson, housekeeper to Bourne Faulkner who testifies that Karen Andre's relationship with Faulkner was sinful. In this trial scene from a movie, Patton plays the woman of sordid relations. You must answer the question. What was the question again? Were you on intimate terms with the deceased? Yes. Were you in his apartment from the time you arrived until Crosby's friends walked in? Yes. Sarah Patton is more verbose, explaining why a wife would leave her husband and children. She had a good reason. Too much mother-in-law. Oh, it was like that. And, as the fortune teller says, a tall, dark man came along. With a lot of understanding and oh, Naturally. You're thinking about the children, aren't you? She's a notorious woman. You wouldn't be proud of her. As far as they're concerned, she died 15 years ago. The role of Faulkner's father-in-law was played by Clyde Fillmore as John Graham Whitfield, who shows here he could bring the bombast and emphatic impertinence that the role calls for. I love them because they're so intelligent. They have such a sense of humor. That's an idea. Putting my wives in cages. Never thought of that. Oh, I don't know. 
why don't you take the occasion to return the 200 mechs I loaned you in a confused moment? Charteris? Who's that? I'm... On paper, it was perfect. But it turned out differently. He was promptly captured. Well, there are other New Years. <laughs> Listen, you can't refuse to drink to my new baby, can you? The man is Robert Shane. Okay, Johnny. You probably think I'm an awful dope reacting this way. No, I don't. By golly, you just don't know what it's like to have a baby like that. Robert Shane played defense attorney Stevens in the Broadway production. We're seeing him 11 years later. He looks old enough here. Variety had thought him too young to play defense attorney in its 1935 review. Boy, that's wonderful. They won't let me see him. They won't let you see your own baby? Listen, don't you ever let anybody take your baby away from you. After well-known actresses were sought for the leading lady role, it went to an actress who had failed in Hollywood and now had returned to New York. She was Doris Nolan, and her stint in The Night of January 16 brought her roles as leading lady in major studio films beginning soon after Night of January 16 ended its successful run. In Holiday, she played sister to Katherine Hepburn, fiancé to Cary Grant. William Bakewell had sizable roles as young men in Hollywood films of the early 1930s before heading east in October 1935 to replace Walter Pidgeon. The film we're seeing him here is from 1934. Oh no, no, you're mistaken. I know the men who are sponsoring this project, and their integrity is beyond question. I want you to endorse these papers. Get out of here. Well, what about my pride? Do you want to see me humbled in front of everyone in this town? You know what it would mean if I failed. I just couldn't go on living here, that's all. You're raving like a Sunday school teacher. You don't know what you're talking about. A month after beginning a night of January 16, a news item reported that William Bakewell was being offered the same role in the London production which would not open for several months. Bakewell was not in the London opening night cast. Night of January 16 was still on Broadway six months after its premiere. This ad appeared five months after the premiere. Edmund Brees and Sarah Patton were signed for a run in Boston which was advertised as presenting Edmund Brees and the original cast. Walter Pidgeon and Doris Nolan had gone to make movies, but the Boston cast list heavily matches the Broadway roster. When the Boston Globe reviewed the opening performance, the report stated that Edmund Breeze had died and his replacement, after short rehearsal, had succeeded in what the newspaper recognized was a lengthy role with exacting demands. That replacement was John Lytell, and we can gauge his ability to play a district attorney by seeing his performance as an attorney three years later. No, I wouldn't want that case, Nancy. I've been reading about it, and I'm afraid the girl's guilty. There's not one bit of extenuating evidence. But she doesn't look like the type who poison anybody. Can't go by type, Nancy. One of the most charming women in history was a murderess, and she committed her crimes for far less than the Lambert estate. If you make a promise in good faith, I'd expect you to live up to it, no matter what it costs you. And, and you'd help me live up to it? Certainly. What kind of a father do you think I am? Well, then, you're going to defend Eula Denning, because I promised her you would. What? Not dead. You just said you'd help me keep a promise. Nancy, you tricked me into this. You're always doing that to me. Now, I won't have you. Productions were mounted by other professional theatrical companies. In San Francisco, the opening night was December 30, 1935, which made New Year's Eve the second night. Edwin Maxwell played the prosecuting attorney in the first San Francisco production of The Night of January 16. We see him on the right in a film shot three years later. You always after me for interviews. Yes, me too. Of course, I did rather promise to make them some sort of statement when I finished here. Uh, you don't mind, do you? Uh, well, it's hardly ethical, Doctor. You oh? see, all statements are supposed to come from me. I see. Well, uh, well, what do you say to giving them some sort of joint interview? I can discuss some of the psychological aspects of the case, and you... Uh, you mean we'd have our pictures taken together? Yes, yes, shaking oh, hands. Oh, splendid idea. <laughs> Variety said Herbert Rawlinson was a capable defense counsel when it reviewed Rawlinson in a subsequent Night of January 16 performance. And the San Francisco Chronicle noted Rawlinson's poise and self-assurance. And while I don't want to seem, well, melodramatic, uh, certain factions have been successful in learning all about them. The profession of a spy has lost its dignity and glamour. Today they're just ordinary common thieves, gangsters. In this envelope are supposed to be blueprints for a new bomb site. It'll be made known that you're going to deliver this to our downtown office. And I have every reason to believe that someone will try to get them. 